because the passage, the only place that I know to get anything meaningful to say to you is the same place Rod gets it. And the same place I think you get it, which is why I so much enjoy being with you when I get an opportunity to do it, because I can count on this. I remember I used to ask my dad when I'd go to movies with him. This is when I was a little elementary school, and we'd see a Western. And every time we'd see a Western, somebody would ride up on a horse early, ride into town or something. And I asked my dad, as I remember it, every time, I needed some context. And I would ask him the question, is that a good guy or a bad guy? Because then I knew whether to root for him or not. Now, it's really kind of silly, because those old Westerns, it was obvious. <laughs> the, the, the bad guy was, had a kind of a growl, you know, growled and had a frown on his face, probably wore a black hat, <laughs> and generally it was the bad guy that showed up first. At any rate, the point is, it was much clearer back then, at least in the movies. So it was easy. He, he would tell me, that's a bad guy, and I'd say, okay, fine. Now I can watch this, and I can get the story. Now, if I want truth, the only place I know to go is this book, where God has revealed to us himself and how to live. And we're going to talk about that this morning. To do that, I want to share with you a statement that I read many years ago. It came from Martin Luther, who made this statement. You might want to tuck this one away and remember it. It'll, it'll come up sometime for you, I'm sure. Martin Luther said, there are two days on my calendar. This day and that day. I love that. Said, those are the only two days. This day, today, and by that day, of course, he meant that day when I'll be on the other side. So what Martin Luther was saying is, I want to live this day in light of what I know about that day. And that's what this passage talks about this morning. So we're going to take a look at that in Romans chapter 5. So we can put the passage back up there. Um, because that, the first part we need to be clear about is that day. Every one of us have lived, some of us longer than others, but if you've lived long enough, you've experienced some pain. You've experienced some suffering of some kind. Some of the suffering I've shared with you before about being involved in an accident and having a traumatic brain injury. And because of that, people thought that was worse than anything they were facing. But the truth is, whatever we're dealing with from the moment we're, we enter the planet, when the umbilical cord is broken, we enter a fallen world. And there will be suffering there. And so we need to learn how to handle it. And so that's why Paul says some of the things that he says in this passage. So he begins, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, now I want to stop right there, and some of you probably know this, I would be surprised if you hadn't heard this from Rod before, but when you look at the first word in that passage, therefore, what does that cause you to, what, what question does that cause you to ask? Thank you. <laughs> I, knew, I knew somebody, I knew somebody, and, and others of you were thinking that you just didn't say it. When you see the word therefore, you want to ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? If you go, therefore, since we've been ju justified by faith, my training won't allow me to try to start interpreting that passage without going and seeing what came before it. Because he's saying something, A, and because of that, therefore, this, therefore, B. Well, I need to find out what the A was. So we're going to go back into chapter 4 very briefly. Abraham, that 
it doesn't appear in the text, that's why I put parentheses around it, but that's what it's talking about. Talking about Abraham gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But his words, the words that was counted to him, were not written for him alone, for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So the therefore takes us back to Abraham, and he's telling us something about Abraham, and the something is that Abraham believed the promise of God. The promise that God had made to him. Now, the promise that God had made to him alluded to the one, uh, one who would come, but who wasn't there yet, the Messiah. But he believed that promise, and the text says it was counted to him as righteousness. So, in other words, Abraham was counted by God to be righteous because of his faith. It's not saying he was righteous. It's not saying he was perfect, because he wasn't. He had his mess-ups, as did every biblical character that I can think of, except for one. You know who the one was, obviously. The, the perfect God-man, who was perfectly man and undiminished deity. But every, every, all the rest of them had their fallenness, and they're displayed right there in front of us in Scripture. I appreciate that authenticity about the Bible, is it presents life as it is, not in some pie-in-the-sky, life isn't like this kind of way. It presents life exactly like it is. And so it says, for Abraham, even though he was fallen, even though... He lied about Sarah, for example. And just as a quick illustration, and there were plenty of other places. But it was counted to him as righteousness. So what he's saying is God took his faith and counted it in terms of his account before God as righteousness. All right, now, that said, that he then leads us to the last phrase that jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification now justification is a theological term it's a legal term and it means to be considered or counted so to be justified before god is to be counted as righteous if somebody had explained this to me when i was 12 years old I'd have been all over it. I could have understood it. You could understand, I could have understood this earlier than that. He's saying he was considered righteous before God. His identity before God is perfectly righteous, not because of his works, but because of his faith, because he believed the promise of God. So, he was justified and paul now takes us from there to romans chapter 5 therefore since like abraham we have been justified by faith let me give you a picture of that that really helps me i know god doesn't actually have a ledger book in heaven at least i don't i'm not aware that he does i've never been told that he does but in terms of an account, you and I have an account before God. I have, I have it on my computer. I have it on my phone now. I have a little budget app on my phone. And when I spend money, if I go to the grocery store, I enter it and it drops, it reduces the amount that I have left in the food category. It's called an account, the food account, or the utilities account, or whatever, or the clothing account. Well, we have an account. This is a, I'm giving you a, if you will, a metaphor to explain what it means to be justified. 
But so I want you to imagine that God has, since this was before computers, we'll, say, we'll assume he's using a, a ledger book, because that's what I used to use. I used to do this on paper. Now I do it on an app on my phone. But I used to do it on paper where I had an, accounts. So you have an account that says the account of, and put your name in there. Mine would say the account of Floyd Green in God's ledger. And on that page is my account showing all of the ways that I have fallen short of the perfection that God requires. To be justified by faith is like God taking a pen and writing across your page based on your faith in the promise of God transferred to the account of Jesus Christ. That's what he did at the cross. And that's what happens when you believe the promise of God of eternal life. If you're depending on his death for you, for your eternal destiny, your sin has been transferred to him. In fact, in the Roman world, when a person committed a crime, a certificate of debt was prepared that enumerated their crimes. And when their crimes had been paid for, they stamped across the certificate of debt a Greek word. The Greek word was tetelestai. Tetelestai means paid in full. This crime this has been paid for. But when Jesus was on the cross, remember when he said, one of the things he said from the cross was, it is finished. The English words, it is finished, are a translation of the Greek word, tetelestai. So when Jesus was on the cross, when he said it is finished, what he was saying is, those who place their trust in what he is, was doing right then, paid in full. So all of your sin, if you've placed your trust in Christ for your eternal destiny, has been paid in full. I don't know any better the news than that. <laughs> the, the only thing that, maybe it's not better, but it just adds to it, there's a, a second part of justification, and that is that he goes to Jesus' account which is a picture of the sum total of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he writes on that page, transferred to the account of, and put your name in there. So your sin has been transferred to his account. His righteousness, the righteousness of the perfect God-man has been transferred to yours. If you want an identity, there's your identity. Your sin has been transferred to the account of Jesus. His righteousness has been transferred to yours. So he says, we have peace with God because of that. Because it's paid in full. It's done. We have peace with him. Present tense. This morning, if that has happened for you, you have, right now, peace with God. He is not at war with you. There are so many times when I feel like God is disappointed with me. And is probably just in heaven shaking his head, going, I thought he'd be further along by now. <laughs> I thought I'd have been, I thought I would be further along by now. And I feel I have so much this is just part of my stuff. But under feeling like I am underperforming. So I end up being an overperformer because of fear of underperforming. And so I feel like God must be disappointed. But he's saying, he's at peace with you. He's, there's no war. He's not at war with you. You can take a deep breath and say, I am at peace with God because I've been justified by faith. Through whom we have also obtained access by faith we just keep saying, by faith, by faith. Notice nowhere in here 
this is an argument from silence, if you will, but the stress in this passage, and there's plenty of other places as well, is by faith, by faith. You don't see any indication that he's saying it's because of what you've done. It's because of your works. It's because of what you've achieved. It's because of people you've led to Christ. And if you have, that's wonderful and something to be so grateful for. But that's not what justifies you before God. It's something to be thankful for that he did through you. But the justification is by faith, not by works. When I look at my works, I'm a way underperformer, which is why I just set the standard low. <laughs> when I was growing up, this will tell you something about my generation. There's a couple of you in here who are close to that generation, but I'm further down the road age-wise than most of you. But I remember when I was a kid, I, there was a period of time when I was afraid to go to sleep at night because I didn't know what happened when you died. And I was afraid to find out. So I just figured, I'm just going to be as good as I can. And feel free to laugh at this, okay? Because I'm okay with that. But <laughs> this is true for my, bro my brother and me. We both decided that the two worst things you could do now, this, this is elementary school level. We're smoking and drinking. Okay, if you do either of those, that's not what this is about. And it was wrong. <laughs> it was wrong, meaning, eh, you can overdo either one of those, and they may not be the healthiest thing. But the point is, we figured, well, if we just can avoid smoking and drinking, whatever's on the other side will be fine. We didn't smoke or drink. Then later it is, don't sleep with your girlfriend. And since about, I don't know, I never took a survey, but plenty of the, my college classmates were doing all those big three, smoking, drinking, and sleeping with their girlfriends or their boyfriends or whatever. And I thought, if I just don't do those things, I'll be fine. Until one day, I ran across this truth, that it's not about that at all. It's about placing my confidence for my future destiny in the promise of God. All right, let's go to the next, the next verse. So he's, I skipped over him, his statement about we've been this grace in which we stand. You stand in the grace of God. That's where we stand as our identity. And not only that. So what we just discovered, uh, which... I know the majority of you already knew, but what I find is it's important for me to keep reminding myself of what I know. Because like Luther said, there's two days on the calendar, this day and that day. Live this day in light of that day. So now he's going to talk about this day. So that day for you is secure. It's settled. It's kind of like, have you ever, those of you who are sports fans, have you ever watched a replay, a, a replay of a game where there was a dramatic play where your team won, came back and won, recovered an onside kick? I'm not going to go any further than that because then I'll make somebody mad because you'll know what I'm referring to. <laughs> I've watched that, mm, okay, maybe a dozen times, and every time I'm relaxed when I watch the replay. It's like minimal stress. There are, there, I will admit that I, there, there are times when I go, are they going to recover that fumble again? <laughs> I mean, are they going to recover that onside kick again? And they do every time because it's past tense. And God is saying to us that our future, if you'll put it just for a moment up the Romans 8.30, passage, Lydia. It says, those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified, counted righteous. And whom he justified, he also glorified. The word glorified means one day we will ha 
have this process in us completed. We're in the process of being transfor transformed into the likeness of Christ in this life. One day it'll, com it'll be completed and we'll be glorified. But he says he also glorified us. It's in the past tense. Your future glorification is so certain that God puts it in the past tense in Romans chapter 8. I just, I just want us to begin where Paul begins here with he saying, be clear about that day. Be clear about your future destiny. Now back to Romans chapter 5. Not only that, once we're clear about our future destiny, we can even rejoice in our sufferings. We can even rejoice in the hard times. I don't particularly like this part, but the truth is our sufferings can end up having a transforming effect, impact in our lives. Most of the change that I can identify in my own life over the years, I would say little to none of it came from times when things were just going to exactly like I wanted them to. There were times when I was experiencing pain of some kind and had to work through the process. And he says, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing several things. First of all, this suffering produces endurance. Produces endurance because we know that there's an end to it. We know our eternal destiny. We know that we're headed for a day that it will, when it will end and there will be no suffering or mourning or pain. So it produces endurance. Endurance produces, and the word produces is it's a natural result. It produces character. It happens. I've learned that living the Christian life is not nearly as laborious as it's often thought of. It's simply look to your future and live today in light of that and watch and see what God produces in your life. Produces character or Christ likeness, which produces hope. And the hope, hope always in the Bible looks forward, it produces hope, meaning it looks forward to a time as I see myself transforming, being transformed, it produces hope that one day that process will be completed. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Okay. What we've said, seen this morning is be clear and keep reminding yourself about your eternal destiny. This would be a great passage to, to just, I don't like so much the word memorize, but to meditate on enough that it just becomes a part of you. Let me close with two quotes. Dr. Kurt Thompson, Christian psychiatrist, said we are all born into the world looking for someone looking for us. And we remain in this mode of searching for the rest of our lives. That's some, that's, that's some, uh, that, that's so deep that I don't fully understand it. But I resonate with it, that we're born looking for someone. I was looking for something. I just didn't know what it was. What I later discovered was I was looking for the eternal God who had died on a cross for me and rose from the dead for my justification. And then finally, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, I love this statement. He says, if I find in myself desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, the only explanation is that was made for another world. I have a 40-year career in financial services and experience speaking into people's lives once I had spoken into my own life that there is no amount of money that satisfies. For many, they would say, well, yeah, what would satisfy me is more. But there isn't an amount. There's not an amount of success. There's not an amount of accomplishment. There's not an amount of notoriety that satisfies. So C.S. Lewis says, if I find that even the good things in this life, in two months, I'll have been married 53 years. 
we're fallen, two fallen human beings, and so we've had, like all fallen human beings, stuff that we've had to work through. But it's fundamentally been a good marriage. And even in a good marriage, it's not enough to fill me up. So what C.S. Lewis is saying, if there's not even the good things in this life, if they're not enough to fully satisfy you, it must mean you were created for another world where those desires that aren't fully satisfied here will be satisfied. Lord, and thank you for this morning. Thank you for these dear people. Pray that you would use this to enable each one of us to live this day in light of that day. Thank you that we have been counted righteous, that our sin has been transferred to Jesus and his righteousness to us. Now enable us in times, even in the hard times and the suffering times, to live in light of that certain future. In Jesus' name, amen.